Well, hey guys, this is Kate, your Plastic Free Mermaid, and I'm reporting live from the Beyond Plastic Pollution Conference, and I'm here with Dr. Mark Brown, an ecologist from UNSW. Yeah, how, how are you? I'm really good, thanks Mark. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. Very well. Oh, good. So Mark has just given an incredible presentation on microfibers. You're coming at this from an ecologist perspective, and you have been out in the ocean, as we all have, and um, noticed that there was marine debris, and in your um, deeper analysis of this, discovered that the most abundant um, debris that you found were microfibers, and that's what has led you to study this more in depth. Um, so I may have just given away my first question. What is the most abundant form of plastic pollution that we're finding in our oceans? The most abundant, abundant form of waste on the planet in our ecosystems are fibers, so over 85 percent of them, in just in terms of number alone, so acrylic, nylon, polyester, cotton, wool, all these sorts of things. We don't hear about this much often. Why, why do you think that is? Um, I think we're getting a lot of greenwashing from um, companies, but also from NGOs talking about other issues. But as a scientist, we really want to be thinking about what's the most abundant form of material we find in the environment, and then trying to reduce that just from a contamination point of view. Right, okay. So we hear plastic bags, we hear cigarette butts, but it's actually the fibers flying off of our clothing. It's crazy, you know, we're seeing lots of action about plastic microbeads or plastic bags or plastic containers or, you know, various sorts of um, plastics. But actually, when we're looking at the most abundant material, nothing's happening. And mm. so we really need to think about how we can avoid that, how we can intercept that, how can we redesign products to stop those problems from occurring. Addressing microfibers is, despite not getting too much attention in the media, is actually one that we could probably solve because we know the pathway. It's direct. It's from the washing machine. We put our clothing into the washing machine, and then it travels through the waterway into the oceans or into the environment um, from that wastewater out of the washing machine. Yeah, so we have a range of solutions available to us. We can have a, avoid certain products, like maybe avoid plastic fibers as opposed to natural fibers. We have some products that might be able to intercept some of those fibers. They might be more durable or they might be washing machine filters. Or we might be able to redesign some of those products to re remove features that cause emissions or impacts. But all of those require us to test and determine the costs and benefits of those. And then from that evidence base, we then look at which is the best available. And then we provide that information to industry, government, and public so they can make better choices. Okay. So right now we're trying to provide that information to you guys, to the public, to make better choices. How do the fibers impact life in the oceans and in the environment? So the fibers get into organisms. They then cause an inflammatory response, which causes it's like banging your hand and it sort of goes red. And then um, after a while that can lead to scar tissue being formed. DNA can start to unwind, which is the sort of building blocks of cells. We can see some cells dying. Sometimes their immune function changes. So we see a whole range of impacts. We see chemicals transferring from those polymers and going into the tissues of organisms. We see the whole granule actually transferring from the point of entry over the lungs or the stomachs of individuals and going into blood cells and going into tissues. Well, what kind of organisms and how would that impact humans? So organisms we eat um, certainly have tiny particles of microfibers in them. Um, we have microfibers in our households at home in the dust that we have to get rid of each week. It's Ew. the most annoying thing that we have to get rid of. Um, we see in the tumble dry lint that we take out the tumble dry on, on that sort of lint trap. So there's a range of different processes it can get in. We'll be breathing it in at home, um, but organisms will be taking it in and then we'll be eating those organisms. So there's many routes that can come into us, so we really need to understand which of those routes is more important and mm. which types of fibers cause more problems. This is very much an asbestos type issue because asbestos mm. is made up of a range of different um, fibers. Some of those are more toxic than others, and it's similar with these types of fibers as well. Some of them have more problems compared to others. So we need to understand those. We need to understand the options that we have available to us so that we can all make those better choices. But without evidence, all we're doing is relying on a lot of marketers who mm. have been greenwashing the hell out of people, and we need to really stop that really. Yeah, don't believe the lies. <laughs> it's a tough one. So lots of these things people assume didn't happen a mm. while ago. We've shown through research that they actually do happen. And so the question is, through this understanding, can we use that to choose more kinder materials? And the medical sector do this a lot. You know, a medical item can't be put on the market until it's shown to be 
the most um, durable and the least toxic one available. So right. things like artificial plastic joints or hernia meshes. Uh, the choice of polymers and the physical features they have determine which ones are on the market. Mm -hmm. They can't go on the market until they've demonstrated safety. Why don't we have that for products that we find in the environment? No kidding. How do we reduce the amount of microfibers going into the environment or into our water streams? Yeah, so there, ever since I first showed this, this issue a while ago and tries to raise public awareness, one of the downsides has been there's an awful lot of companies coming on board and essentially greenwashing. So that happens when a product is put on the market, it's to solve a particular environmental problem, but then there's no evidence behind it as to whether or not it's worked. Okay. And we've seen various bags and washing machine filters marketed as a solution to the issue that I first identified back in 2011. Mm. And that's a real problem for me as a scientist because we're misleading people about whether or not they're effective. If you're mm. putting a bag into a washing machine, that bag takes up space. Mm. It's made of plastic fibers itself. Mm. The fibers come off the clothing, go into the bag, then what do you do with them? Mm. Are they still on the clothing or are they in the bag? How do you safely get rid of those? Mm. You know, other types of washing machine filters where they're putting something in to collect fibers in the actual wash itself, are those causing the fabrics to degrade at quicker rates? Mm. How effective are they? How mm. easy are they to clean? These are all types of things which we need to make sure that we're doing proper testing on. Mm. These are concepts that are well understood in the medical sector about how you properly test products. The problem is the medical sector has plastic products that are well regulated. Right. We have plastic products that are poorly regulated and we find them in the environment. Mm. So we're probably about 60 years behind the biocompatibility people medicine and benign by design provides a solution for us to catch up and even, even overtake them. Okay um, and uh, how were you able to reduce by 50% the amount of microfibers entering the waterways? So we were very very lucky we partnered with a, um, a local council who enabled us to test some of these washing machine filters I can't tell you which ones okay. they are unfortunately. Not yet? Not, not yet we have to wait for it to come through peer reviewed okay. next year unfortunately, so that other people check what we've done is correct. Mm. Um, but essentially that showed that when you have a finer size pore size on the actual filter, we've got much larger reductions and we saw that with a range of natural and synthetic fibers as well. So the, the next step is really to try and do a much larger test to see if it works. Frustrating I know for the public who want answers. <laughs> But yeah. this is where the call out to the appliance industry. Yeah, we've been doing a lot of this stuff on our weekends and yeah. evenings when, we, when, you know, when we should be with our loved ones or family yeah. doing things. So. We, we try our best, but unless the science is funded, yep. um, you know, these things are slow. So before okay. you start giving money to lots of um, you know, various uh, groups who tackle particular issues, ask them about how they're supporting scientific research, yep. and is that scientific research giving us information about how to make better choices. Okay. So lots of work, even from some of the scientists here today, isn't necessarily providing people with the choices to be able to solve a particular problem. That's what we need to do. That's right. Otherwise, we're perpetually telling people about a doomsday scenario. Right. And people are going to get switched off. Mm. And what are you seeing in this design space? Seeing a lot of uh, clothing companies come to, come to the forum. So we have people like Eileen Fisher talk to us about how to deal with it. We have some other companies who work with some sporting companies think about how to look at particular options they have for making clothes and test those. But we also see a lot of government getting involved. So we see a lot of the sewage treatment companies like Melbourne Water, and in particular some of the local councils here in Sydney like Mosman Council or Hornsby Shire Council, who have been really leading the way in terms of actually identifying this as a major pollutant through funding work that looks at the pathways of material into the environment. Right. Well, let's start with how do we design our products? How do we design our clothing to be um, more durable? Or what are, the, what are the sorts of features that we want our clothing to have? Are older clothing better um, because they were designed more durably? Do we have fast fashion impacting our, our materials these days? What are things that you're looking at? So we're looking at a range of different options. Um, we're only just starting on this initiative because the clothing company is quite slow to get involved with us. But we look at different brands. We look at different types of polymers that they use. We look, look at different types of knit in the fabric. And then we look at those about how those features actually affect emissions and impacts. And from that, we're then able to look at <clears throat> what those emissions could do to organisms. We have a system that adds those same emissions of doses to organisms in the environment. 
and then we know which one causes the least pollution. So we're at the early stages, we can't give firm information yet, but we're certainly seeing um, the clothing sector step up to this. We're just really waiting for the appliance machine industries to come forward. So Bosch, Samsung, um, you know, Dyson, all these, you know, FICOL, all these people need to come forward and actually say, we've got washing machines, we know that these fibers come from this process. Okay. Let's see if we can test different features of the washing machine to try to reduce this particular problem. But at the moment, lots of movement from industry, lots of movement from government, lots of public interest. The appliance industry, we haven't really seen you. So if any of you are watching this, please see if you can work with us because we'd really like to try and address this issue with your help. Are synthetic fibers, plastic fibers, the only ones to be of concern or do cotton or natural fibers, are those harmful as well? So we have an article in the New York Times that discusses this particular issue. Just because something's natural doesn't mean it's better. Mm. Some of these natural fibers have to have a lot of chemicals added to them. Right. Some of the natural fibers will use a lot of water in the process compared to, say, some of the synthetic ones. However, some of the synthetic ones, when we've done our trials with them, actually the washing cycles use twice as much water as the mm. natural ones. So unless you understand all these complicated pros and cons of each at each stage, it's impossible and no wonder the public's confused about this issue because industry and government hasn't really been shown the leadership to provide the scientific funding to provide the solutions to mm. people. You know, what choice should I make, you know, each day about how to address this issue? Because the public clearly wants that. But mm. The way we use chemicals is a very strange way. So we allow them to go on the market with no form of testing. And then we then wonder why there is a particular problem later on. Do you mind explaining yeah, what sure. green chemistry is? Sure. So green chemistry is a process which a lot of chemists advocate people are doing about this issue. And they say that you replace one chemical with another chemical. And they tend to say, well, we get, if there's a toxic chemical, we replace it with a more benign one. The problem is there's 15,000 new chemicals put on the market every single day. Less than 0.4% of those have any form of regulation, so they're not tested. That's amazing. Say that again. 15,000 chemicals, brand new ones on the market every single day. Less than 1% of those have any form of regulation. So what happens is lots of studies uh -oh. finally get done about older chemicals and fewer studies about newer chemicals. So older chemicals will appear more toxic compared to newer chemicals. The green chemists will then say, we obviously need to replace one chemical with another chemical. And so we see lots of replacements going on. So some of the problems of bisphenol A have been highlighted because the BPA. Yeah, the replacements caused you know, similar problems as the original did. And so we have to be careful. There's also another issue that... Was that one, were they, was the replacement chemical, what was it called? Uh, it, was a, it was a mon... So B, BPA is a monomer of plastics. It's yep. a building block of it. And they just switched a few atoms around and that meant that... It had a new name, but it had, had the it, same similar yeah, toxic same, effects. same, but sort of different, you know? And you was know. that one regulated? Did they pull that off the market, or no, it's still out there in use? This is an example of okay. a green chemistry initiative where the chemical has been replaced with another one that people think is safe because of the marketing and because of the chemical information, then it's shown toxicity-wise to be causing a much larger problem. The second problem of green chemistry is this, is that certain medicines that we can have we're not allowed to have things like grapefruit or something mm. with them because there can be these antagonistic or synergistic consequences. One chemical can make something more toxic. Mm. And green chemistry can't deal with that because it can't deal with all the mixtures. You okay. need to look at all the possible combinations. It's impossible. So what we do at Benign by Design is that we look at the available options that people are using at the moment, identify which ones of those work best, which ones reduces emissions, reduces ecological impacts. And then we understand those features and we incorporate those features into products. The ones mm. that cause them to become, you know, to shed more or to cause more toxicity, we say take those out. Okay. And we've been using that approach for other types of products that cause problems in the environment for over a decade. You know, here in Sydney Harbour, we have seawalls that cause huge ecological impacts. Mm -hmm. And through work with local councils, we've shown that if you add a feature onto those sea walls, which is a rock pool that actually retains features, a concrete flower pot in essence that goes on the outside of them, you can improve biodiversity by 110%. So that's this ecological engineering that we want to use for this problem associated mm. with plastic. Big questions around plastic clothing. Is there better clothing to wear? Is there, um, should we be choosing natural fiber clothing? Are recycled plastic swimwear, is that okay to wear? Is it better? Is it weaker in the washing machine? Talk to me. 
yeah, we want to find this out. So we've been working with the clothing companies to test it. It's still going on because it's quite complicated because mm. you have one type of clothing, you test it in a washing machine. You then need to test multiple washing machines. Okay. You then need to look at how brands, different brands affect things. So we're doing those types of tests. Unfortunately, it's going to be a couple of years until all that information is out. There's so many choices out there. Mm. We need to find out. But certainly at the moment, there's no evidence that plastic fibers are any um, worse than natural fibers. Wow. Um, because those tests haven't been done. So okay. those basic tests, which we thought would be mm. mainstream before a product would be able to be sold, haven't been done. So. Okay. Um, so all of this... Um, I guess, debate around don't wear plastic clothing, that's not really accurate. It's just all clothing in general? We need to look at all the available evidence out there. When we've done this for this particular issue, we found no evidence to support those clothing items being better or worse. Okay. And so that's the unfortunate thing. Sometimes we just don't know. Right. And as scientists will say, I just, I just don't know, and we can tell you that. Other people might offer a solution but not actually have the evidence behind it so mm. we're trying to really make sure that we tell people look we don't know and the reason we don't know is because the science isn't being funded if that science how is frustrating funded, well if the science gets funded we provide the information to people it's not that we want a job doing this for the rest of our lives yeah because we really like looking at plastic in the environment we deal with other sorts of pollution in the environment and we'd much rather solve this particular issue and move on to something else. You know, mm. huge ecological impacts caused by artificial shorelines in the harbour, and those are things that we should be dealing something about. Plastic's very popular at the moment, and I can understand that, but we need to find a way to prioritise issues mm. and to solve issues. We can't just be doing beach cleans for the rest of our lives. No, we definitely don't want to be doing that. We want to be suntanning on the beach and enjoying the beaches, not <laughs> exactly. cleaning them. Um, so, okay, I feel like we know to be waiting for these washing machine filters and to um, request our local governments and federal governments support research and development around this particular issue. Um, but what do we wear? I still need, I need a more, I need a better answer from you, Mark. Yeah, what do we wear? Is I, Swimsuits. I mean, I've got natural and synthetic clothing. I okay. think carry on wearing what you're doing. Um, there are some companies who market themselves as being more sustainable, and, and they, they, the impression sometimes people have is that they're more durable items. Mm. Um, I wouldn't go for those. Okay. Those are some of the people that we've tried to engage with on this issue, um, but have been more happy to market themselves as doing something about it rather than support the sound science behind it. So. Um, I can't name names, unfortunately, but I would just say stick to your normal clothes, do the best you can, tell your local government how great people like Mosman Council, um, people like the Australian Research Council, people like Melbourne Water, people like um, Hornsby Shire Council have been in supporting initiatives and saying, why can't we do something like what they're doing? Mm. Because that would provide the information to people overnight. Yeah. That's, that's great advice. I hope all of you get in touch with your local councils and um, request programs like this. Um, and yeah, keep wearing whatever you want or go naked. That's probably the best solution. <laughs> no fibers if you go naked. No laundry to do. Nothing's shedding in the local environment. Thanks, Mark. No Wait, one more question. Yes. Do we um, absorb any toxicity from wearing plastic over um, natural fibers? I don't know if many people have looked at that. Some people have allergic reactions to okay. some types of fabrics, so cotton fabrics or synthetic ones. Um, and so I think there's possibility of chemical transfer. Okay. Um, but it's just a concern. But that could happen for natural ones as well. Natural okay. fibers have to be dyed a particular color. Mm. And lots of those nasty dyes aren't very good for us. So yeah. we need to be thinking very clearly about those. So mm. options for people to solve solutions here. We have a website that talks about some of our initiatives called Benign by Design. If you Google that um, with, with my name, you'll be able to find out about all the work that we're doing. Oh, that's great. And it will explain more about what we had the presentation earlier. Oh, that's great. Yep, everyone, Benign by Design, um, I think that's a great plug because I know that this is an evolving issue. People have so many questions around it and um, you're such a source and wealth of information. So thank you for sharing thank and thank you for all the work that you're doing on this. I'm sure we'll all be following your work closely as you come up with these um, washing machine filters that we're all going to be excited to invest in. Um, and I also appreciate your um, honesty and transparency around not having evidence pointing towards um, plastics being worse than natural. I know it's uh, you know we we always kind of want that solution, um, 
you know, what do we do? Give us the answer, yes or no, plastics or cotton. Um, but what, what, I'm, what I'm learning at this conference um, from almost every presentation is that there isn't just a yes, no. It's not black, white. It's that we have to be savvy consumers. We have to question everything. We have to be more involved in our consumer choices um, so that we're not just buying everything that we see. We're not just buying these fast fashion um, pieces of clothing that fall apart immediately. You know, just be be a little bit more savvy. Try to support the people who truly feel like they're doing the right things um, and, and just avoid anything with lots of chemicals. I, think so. I mean, I think the whole issue of this is to be critical rather than political, is to ask people when they're giving you advice about what choice to make, say, where is the evidence for that? Mm. And if you do that with each person who then, you know, they, they will think twice about providing misinformation to people. Mm. And we can all look at different qualities of evidence and we can assess it and we can determine which ones are more useful than others. Yeah. And so we're always happy to provide that to people. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Thanks so much, guys. We're going to get back to the conference. Bye. See ya.